Good evening. Good to see you all here tonight, uh, both you who are physically present here and also want to welcome those who are joining us online over the internet. So uh, we are very much have been looking forward to Michael Dowd's presence uh, tonight. I will never forget, uh, I don't think, uh, when he was here last. And the uh, one image in particular he put up on the screen, uh, one of the first photographs, if not the first photograph, of an astronaut floating out in space looking back at the Earth for the first time, you know, the photograph of that. And his comment, you know, we are the Earth's uh, self, coming into self-awareness, you know, that we, we actually are part of the Earth's awareness of itself. And I've been chewing on that ever since. So if you're new to uh, the church tonight, I want to especially welcome uh, you here and uh, note that uh, if you need to use restrooms, they're out and to the left. And if you have one of uh, these little devices in your pocket. That's actually, this, this looks like a Bible. It's actually a cell phone. <laughs> they don't steal your Bible this way. <laughs> I mean, your cell phone this way. Uh, if you'll set that to, like, off or vibrate or stun or what have you, um, that would be appreciated. Um, the, so the flow of the evening, um, uh, Michael will speak for uh, the first hour or so, and then uh, we'll take about 15, 20 minutes of questions, and then uh, we'll be off out into uh, to the... Uh, uh, the foyer where we'll have uh, refreshments, books, book signing, all those, those things coming up. Um, you, you should have received this evening a, one of these cards. It's an evaluation card. We'd love it if you would fill that out. If you'd like to get on the mailing list, that would be great. Uh, but there's a lot of, several questions we're trying to take, you know, get your feedback on uh, future events. In fact, there's a place for comments, uh, suggestions. If you have a suggestion for a future speaker, for instance, we'd love to have it there. Uh, that, this, that section's near and dear to me because about a year before I came to Countryside, somebody wrote in this section, I think Eric Elna should come and speak. And now here I, here I am as minister. So. <laughs> but don't suggest another minister uh, to come. <laughs> just, just for the speakers for Center for Faith Studies. Uh, <laughs> I uh, want to thank the volunteers to, who have helped uh, this evening. We have people who provided refreshments and ticket sales and, and are on the Internet uh, answering uh, or fielding questions that will also come from the Internet, and uh, thank you all for helping. At this time, I'd like to invite uh, Kelly Keller, our director for the Center for Faith Studies, forward, and she will introduce our speaker. Thank you. It's nice to see you all here tonight. Uh, before we get started, we are at almost 10 years of the Center for Faith Studies being in existence here at uh, Countryside. And I think we should give a tremendous applause to Countryside for continuing this ministry for 10 years. And I think this is a perfect opportunity for Cindy Kugler, who I know is here. Where'd she go? Stand up. Stand up, Cindy. She had the vision to start this. So it was through Cindy's vision that this Center for Faith Studies started 10 years ago, just under that very simple notion that we could come together and explore ideas across faith, science, uh, theology, history, arts, and humanities, and come together and decide maybe how we're being called forward to be the people of God in the world today. And I want to thank Cindy for, for her vision to that. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce Michael Dowd. Uh, I've actually gotten to um, be with Michael over the last couple of days because uh, he is here um, today partly because of the great uh, March for Climate Action, um, and we had these marchers in Omaha over the last three days, uh, and he was speaking down at uh, the Bob Carey Bridge, um, uh, celebrating the vision and persistence of these walkers who are walking from uh, California all the way to Washington, D.C., two of whom were on crutches. Um, and he was just kind of bolstering them, and then today was there doing some work for their community, because that can obviously be a drag on people as well. And so Michael is a minister to, uh, to that community as well, and so I'm sure they're very grateful that you were here. 
Um, as you can see in your program, uh, Dowd is the author of Thank God for Evolution, uh, How the Marriage of Science and Religion Will Transform Your Life and Our World. And um, if you haven't read that book yet, I would highly recommend it. Um, I just read it for the first time this summer. And I felt like I might have to hide it a couple times because I had my very conservative father-in-law in town <laughs> while I was having this book with, with the Darwin fish kissing the Jesus fish. Um, but I didn't. We ended up having um, excellent uh, conversations. Uh, uh, Michael graduated. Um, oh, no, no, that's too much information. Too much? I won't do that? Okay. Yeah. So I'm not allowed to tell you his glorious past, but he does have quite the, the history of working for the environment. It's in your bulletin. <laughs> oh, it's not in there. Oh. Um, so, but it's on, online. So I know that Michael wants to get going on the, the presentation, but I just um, want to introduce him with the way that he... Um, in his talk is different than a lot of talks that we hear about the environment. It's a message of hope, and it's a message that we can all use. And if I can quote you, uh, and this has been on my tagline for my email uh, for the last couple of weeks. The quote from his book says, trusting the universe or having faith in God means trusting that everything is right on schedule. But it also means trusting that the anguish and the anger we sometimes feel for what is happening around us and our yearnings for a just and sustainable society, that's part of the universe too, and right on schedule as well. So in my opinion, I think we're right on schedule having Michael Dowd here at Countryside. And please join me in welcoming Michael. Thank you, Kelly. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hello? Hello? I'm here, Lord. I'm, I'm about to get started. So. so I've titled this program, The Future is Calling Us to Greatness. Right relationship to reality and to God in the 21st century and beyond. And as you'll see, and as you heard on Sunday if you were here, I use the words God and reality interchangeably, and I'll make the case why I think it's not only legitimate, but perhaps even really important for religious people to do that. Now, I did a program, a TEDx program uh, just a few months ago called Reality Reconciles Science and Religion. And you can find that on YouTube, uh, but I'll be covering that material there are many different paths to right relationship to reality. There's no one way to right relationship to reality. This path that I'll be sharing this evening, I call the path of factual faith or sacred realism. I want to quote Thomas Berry, my great mentor who died just a few years ago at the start. He said, we are talking only to ourselves. We are not talking to the rivers. We are not listening to the wind and the climate. Most of the disasters that are happening now are a consequence of that spiritual autism. Now, just a little background. My wife, Connie Barlow, is a science writer. She'll be out at the book table. She's written four science books, From Gaia to Selfish Genes and Evolution Extended, are both MIT press books. The Ghosts of Evolution was Amazon.com's top recommended science book for three months when it came out in 2001. And Green Space, Green Time, The Way of Science, you could say the spirituality of science. This is one of the leading books in what's called religious naturalism. My background is in ministry. I pastored three United Church of Christ congregations over the course of a decade. I've also done sustainability and transformational education, and I've written two books, my book back in 1990, Earth Spirit, and more recently, Thank God for Evolution. So basically, where science, inspiration, and sustainability intersect is what our life uh, ministry is all about. We've been living on the road since April of 2002, traveling, living out of the generosity of people who open up their homes to us. And you've probably seen the side of our van. We've got the Jesus and Darwin fish kissing with hearts between them. Definitely gets us some interesting looks in conservative parts of the world like this. <laughs> got flipped off last time I was in Texas. <laughs> but it's also gotten us some interesting press. For example, here I am on Fox and Friends on Sunday morning, Fox News, and at the start they were skeptical, and after five minutes they were like, well, thank God for evolution. That's a book whose time has come. This is Fox News, right? My mother was watching. I was pleased. So uh, we've, 
we've spoken to about 2,000 groups, and they break down into radically different populations. And I can do the same program in all these different settings. And I know from experience, because we've given surveys, that 90% of the people that come to the programs are going to love it. Now, I find that encouraging, because what we focus on is the sacred side of science. Again, what I call factual faith or sacred realism. Now, I use this phrase religion 3.0. I mentioned on Sunday, religion, I'll say a little bit more about the distinction between religion 1.0 and 2.0 and 3.0. Um, but basically, there are two commandments as I see it to this meta-religious perspective that's uniting tens of millions of us around the world. The importance of living in right relationship with reality, whether we use secular or religious language to talk about reality, and the need to co-create a just and healthy future. And I know from experience that people across the godism spectrum, in fact, Connie and I had to create our own bridge building term that can be pronounced creatheist or creatheist. You know. It's creativity is divine, right? But naturalists and supernaturalists, as well as religious people and secular people from radically different populations. And I find this very encouraging. That, and I know this because I've spoken in all these different settings. I love this little image. Right? right relationship to reality is what has always mattered for all species and certainly for humanity. And one of the things that we need to keep in mind is that words, because we live in symbolic language, we live in a world created by symbolic language, words create worlds. And language changes over the centuries. I'll come back and we'll spend quite some time on that. Because what we call reality, the ancients called God, or if you lived in a polytheistic culture, the gods. And we don't merely believe this. We know this. The evidence is compelling. And whatever else right relationship to reality means, it's got to include being in right relationship with the air, the water, the soil, and the life of this planet. It's also got to include being in right relationship to future generations. Besides, I love showing off my granddaughter. So I dedicate this program to Isla Renee and to her grandchildren. Loyal Rue is a philosopher of religion, one of the most significant philosophers of religion, and he's got a book called Religion is Not About God. And what he means is that religion is about our relationship to reality. And yes, reality has been personified as the various gods and goddesses. But what religion is about is helping us live in right relationship to what's inescapably real, beyond belief. I love this quote. He says, the most profound insight in the history of humanity is that we should seek to live in accord with reality. Indeed, living in harmony with reality may be accepted as a formal definition of wisdom. If we live at odds with reality, foolishly, then we will be doomed. But if we live in right relationship with reality, wisely, then we will be saved. Now, of course, he's, he goes on to say that all cultures have had at least a tacit understanding of this fundamental principle, but what we're less in agreement about is how we should think about reality and what practices we should use to put ourselves into harmony or alignment with it. But that makes total sense when you realize that these two fundamental questions that humans have always needed to address, what's real or how things are, and what's important, which things matter, these questions would have been answered differently at different times in history and different places around the world. Reality shows up differently. It's like the five blind men or the five blind people in the elephant. If you've got five different blind people all experiencing a different aspect of reality, a different aspect of the elephant, if these were five different theologians, you'd have five radically different theologies. And believe it or not, religious differences aren't a lot more complex than that. I mean, reality, ten, you know, 100,000 years ago in a family or a band in South Africa is very different than reality, say, 50,000 years ago in a tribe. Then a bunch of tribes interact, and they face some crisis, some challenge, some chaos, some difficulty. They figure out how to align the self-interests of each tribe with a new level of complexity, and a chiefdom or a kingdom emerges. Then you get a bunch of chiefs and kingdoms interacting. This is how the world has become as complex as it is. And all the re religious traditions of the world reflect regional collective intelligence around these questions. But what we now need isn't just tribal collective intelligence, nor do we need just regional collective intelligence. We need our best globally produced answers to these questions. And that's what science is. You don't understand science if you think it's just another language game. The postmodernists have it wrong on that. Science reflects humanity's global collective intelligence around these questions. 
You've got Christian scientists, Buddhist scientists, Hindu scientists, atheist scientists, scientists of all religious tradition and no religious tradition that are all contributing to our common understanding of what's real and what's important or how things are and which things matter. Now, of course, this begs the question, what's religion? Is religion just supernatural otherworldlyism, as some of the new atheists charge? I suggest to you, no. Oh, by the way, this is me at the bottom of Deer Creek Falls in the Grand Canyon. This actually goes up 140 feet. Uh, we rafted, Connie and I rafted four years ago uh, for a week down the Colorado River uh, through the Grand Canyon with a bunch of geologists and science people. It was wonderful. But religions are mythic maps of what's real and what's important. And when I say mythic, what I mean is they help us relate to reality. That's what the nature of myth is. They give us a relationship, an I-thou relationship to reality, rather than an I-it relationship. That's why myths are essential. And religions also provide personal wholeness and social coherence. There's no religion in the world that doesn't consistently provide personal wholeness and social coherence by providing a map of what's real and what's important. And all religions provide consistent access to the feeling states that humans have always needed to thrive. We simply cannot thrive as human beings if all we can do is look to the future with fear. We can only thrive when we can look to the future with trust, including trusting that we're not gonna be here forever, we're gonna die. All religions get people to trust. They do so via different beliefs, but they get people to trust. The same thing, we can't thrive or we don't thrive as human beings if all we can do is look to the past with resentment or guilt or bitterness. We can only thrive when we can look to the past with gratitude. And now we even have secular ways of helping us do that. Therapy is in large part helping people to restory, to reinterpret their past to find something to be grateful for where before all they had was resentment or bitterness or guilt. And same thing. We can't thrive as human beings. We don't thrive if we are uh, overwhelmed by the challenges of the day. We can only thrive when we're inspired to be in action, whatever the challenges are. Because as we all know, compost happens. You know, life just throws us a big pile of dung to deal with sometimes. So how do we stay inspired to be in action, whatever the challenges are? Well, all religions, without exception that I'm aware of, get people to these feeling states. Again, they do so via different belief systems, but they get people to these fundamental feeling states that we need to thrive and personal wholeness and social coherence. Now, I did a program a few years ago where there was a specific, a Christian church in Canada that wanted to know, like, how can we use God language, or can we use God language in a way that's soundly grounded in our best scientific understanding? And so I created a, a, a song, so humor me on this one, please. Uh, you know that Tina Turner song, What's Love Got to Do With It? Well, I created my own version. What's God got to do, got to do with it? What's God but an ancient mythic notion? What's God got to do, got to do with it? Who needs Poseidon? Plate tectonics made the ocean. <laughs> an old mentor of mine said, if you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> yeah, keep the day job, I know. My publicist said to me one time when I did, oh, I think I, no, it, did, it wasn't the TED Talk. It was somewhere. I did a program. He calls me up and he says, I've got one piece of advice. I am on my knees begging, please, please, please don't sing. <laughs> now, here's the thing, though. If you lived in the Pacific Northwest 500 years ago, this is, this is where I took this picture, and you've got this huge boulder that's almost the size of this building, and it's, it's in the middle of a field. No other mountains anywhere nearby. How would you describe, what would you, what would you or your culture, or your tribe, your people, what story would you tell about how that boulder got there? Not having a story was not a possibility. Anything this cool or this weird or this interesting demands a story. And my hunch is God did it would have been the way most cultures would have talked about how that boulder got there. Now, you, or the goddess or great spirit, but you would have different stories that would all talk about how God got that boulder there. And they could be very different stories. Well, then... In the 1920s, J. Harlan Bretz, a geologist, started noticing these interesting geological features in the Pacific Northwest. And now we know that 17 times the glaciers have come south and the glaciers have gone back. 17 times. And every time they've come south, they've blocked the Clark Fork River and created this humongous dam, I mean this humongous lake, Glacial Lake Missoula, is about the size of Lake Superior. Those mountains are so big. 
And when it filled up, it broke the ice dam, and it, all this water would rush. In 48 hours, it would all make its way to the Pacific Ocean, and it would thunder down. You could hear it coming, they said, from, from about an hour. And these icebergs would be carrying boulders and drop them along the way. It scoured this land here. The water couldn't get out of the Willamette Valley, so it dropped a lot of silt, which is why that's such a fertile valley. And this happened dozens of times. So, 500 years ago, God did it. 70 years ago, God didn't do it. It happened through natural causes. And what we can now finally appreciate is these are different ways of saying basically the same thing. The words God and evolution are both pointing to the same divine creative process. Both answer the question, how did we get here? How did everything get here? One uses the mythic or relational language of religion, the other the literal or empirical language of science. Arguing whether it's God or evolution that created everything is like debating whether it's Uncle Sam or the U.S. government that insists I pay taxes every year. Or like quarreling over whether it was Gaia or plate tectonics that created the oceans and the mountains. Such silly and largely unnecessary confusion will remain the norm until we get and celebrate personification. I consider this the single most important scientific discovery about religion in the last hundred years. Or to use theological language, this I consider the most significant religious revelation in the last hundred years. James Hillman spoke about loving is a way of knowing, and for love to know, it must personify. Personifying is thus the heart's mode of knowing. It's not a lesser, primitive way of apprehending, but a finer one. To enter myth, we must personify, and to personify carries us into myth. It's the essence of myth. In fact, myths die when they stop personifying because that gives us an I-thou relationship. And again, he's using the term myth not as an untrue story, but a narrative that puts us in accord with the nature of reality. As Joseph Campbell said, puts one in accord with the cosmos. Martin Buber, the great uh, Jewish theologian, in his book, I just reread this last year, I and Thou, he talked about the radical difference between an I-Thou relationship to others and to nature and an I-It relationship. And he said that if we treat any person or any aspect of nature as an It to be used or exploited by us rather than a Thou to be honored and respected in its own right, he said the divine is not present. God is not present. And ultimately, we will destroy ourselves. We will cause our own extinction if we continue to relate to nature as an it to be used rather than a thou to be honored and respected. And that's how we've been relating to nature, as a complex clock. For 500 years, we invented pendulum clocks, and we started using pendulum clocks as our basic analogy for nature. The problem is, once you think of nature as a complex clock, where is the only place that the creativity that made the clock, where is the only place it can possibly be? Outside the clock. Because if you have a watch or that clock back there, any clocks have the creativity that made it outside of it. So if nature is a complex clock, God is trivialized. No longer is God imminent and omnipresent, as our tradition has always said. You know, there's no place that God stops and something else starts. Now God is the clockmaker outside a clockwork universe that you can either believe in or not. So God becomes trivialized and nature becomes desacralized. We can do anything we want with it. We can dig it up, blow it up, plow it up, whatever. It's just nature, right? Because our true home is somewhere else when we die. This is just the way, you know, we're passing through. And the consequences of this worldview have been truly tragic. Much of the issues that we're dealing with today, including climate change, have their roots deep down in this mechanistic cosmos. In fact, Thomas Berry is a mentor of mine, my, one of my great mentors. He said, basically, the world we live in is an honorable world. To refuse this deepest aspect of our being, to deny honor where honor is due, is to place ourselves on a head-on collision course with the ultimate forces of the universe. He said, this question of honor must be dealt with before any other question. It's ultimately not a political, economic, or even an environmental issue. It's ultimately a question of honor. Only the sense of the violated honor of earth and the need to restore that honor will awaken in humans the energy needed to co-create a just and healthy future. 
Gregory Bateson, believe it or not, said it maybe even stronger. He said, if you imagine God as a supreme being outside of nature and you think of yourself as created in the image of God, you'll logically and naturally see yourself as above and outside the things around you. And as you unrightfully claim all mind to yourself, you'll see the world around you as mindless and therefore not entitled to moral or ethical consideration. He said, the world will seem to be yours to exploit. He said, if this is your estimate of your relationship to nature and you have an advanced technology, your likelihood of survival will be that of a snowball in hell. You will die either of the toxic byproducts of your own hate or simply from overpopulation and overgrazing. You could put climate change in there too. The world is not a complex clock. And we must come into an I-thou relationship. Whether you use male or female metaphors, it doesn't matter. My intellectual, one of my intellectual mentors was Wittgenstein. And he was a, one of the most famous philosophers of the 20th century. He loved to piss off philo other philosophers and theologians because he claimed that virtually all theological problems and most philosophical problems are caused because of the way we don't understand language, how it works. He called them language games. This understanding that words create worlds and language changes over the centuries. For example, I'm going to show a sequence of words and none of these words existed for the Hebrews. In fact, none of these concepts existed for the Hebrews. Now, you're going to be shocked, and you're going to think I'm crazy. Let me make my case. Life, time, wind, breath, reality, nature, climate, universe, and environment. None of those words existed for the Hebrews, and none of those concepts existed for the Hebrews. In fact, the Hebrew word for time was the same as distance. In fact, the Hebrew word for both wind and breath was ruach, ruach Adonai, ruach Elohim, the spirit of God. They personified, they had an I-thou relationship with what we call breath and wind. See, it didn't matter whether you believed in the spirit of God or not. You couldn't not experience the spirit of God. This was an undeniably real reality. The only time you, you don't experience the Spirit of God is when you stop breathing. You die. You're no longer breathing. This does not have to be understood in an otherworldly way. And all of these would have been interpreted. What we mean by these all existed for the Hebrews, obviously, right? But they would have been interpreted. We are interpreting animals. And, they would have, and, and the way that the Hebrews interpreted most of these things was when the climate did something, this was Yahweh doing it. This was the Lord Here's the heart. This slide is the heart of what I want to try to say this evening. The radical difference between fictional and factual understandings of uh, spiritual entities, gods, you know, demons, spirits, whatever. Or you could say the difference between unnatural and undeniable. For example, pick any god or goddess from history, any culture. Those of you that were here on Sunday, I'm going to repeat myself. But those of you that weren't, I'm going to sort of make sure we're all on the same page. Poseidon was not the god of the oceans or the spirit of the oceans, as if there was some non-material entity separate from water. Poseidon was a personification of the incomprehensibly powerful and capricious seas. And I was giving human characteristics. That's what our brains do. Helios was not the god of the sun or the spirit of the sun. Helios was a personification of this big ball of flame and light that gives us life. And it didn't matter whether you believed in Helios or not. You didn't have any atheists saying, oh, I don't believe in Helios. Well, whatever you mean by this is what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> Gaia, same thing, was not the goddess of the earth. Gaia was a personification of earth. Eros, same thing with our inner reality. Eros was not the god of love or lust or the spirit of love or lust. Eros was a personification of what we today call love or lust. And the reason that the ancients talked about the immortality of the gods is because humans are born and humans die. Humans come and humans go. Lust is always there. Poseidon is always there. Helios is always there. Gaia is always there. And you don't have to take my word on it. In fact, please do not take my word on it. Google any of these terms, anthropomorphism, deities, personification, gods, goddesses, personify. In fact, you can take gods, goddesses, personify and put Aztec or China or India or Rome or Greece and you will have dozens of web pages 
that show you all the different gods and goddesses that personified aspects of their inner reality and their outer reality. And notice the radical difference between believing in Gaia and honoring Gaia. Between worshiping Poseidon and respecting Poseidon. See, this is what Wittgenstein was getting at. <laughs> we don't understand the way language works. We get all fouled up with our language. And, and this book came out 20 years ago. Stuart Guthrie, Faces in the Clouds. And it's now the standard. It is now the foundation of an entire body of research. There's a whole school called Evolutionary Religious Studies. There's like 150 scholars involved. You've got Christian, I mean, yeah, Christian scholars and Buddhist scholars and Hindu scholars and atheist scholars all trying to understand religion from our best scientific understanding of all different kinds, neurobiology and, and cognitive neuroscience and all kinds of stuff. See, a factual view of God transcends belief or disbelief. It doesn't matter whether we believe in reality or not. Reality is something that every plant, every animal, and every human being cannot not experience inwardly and outwardly. That's why I love this next quote from Philip K. Dick. Reality is that which, when you stop believing in it, doesn't go away. And those of us who consider ourselves evolutionary theologians, this is what we're pointing to with the word God. Not some supernatural being who blesses some and smites others, but a personification, an I-thou relationship to what's fundamentally, undeniably, inescapably real. In fact, I think there's three things. Time, nature, and mystery are real whether we believe in them or not. The past is real. 13.8 billion years of creativity made this moment possible. If we act as if the future is not real, we will condemn the future. And of course, the present moment is real. So time is real, regardless of our beliefs. But nature is also real. Our inner nature, our outer nature, our social nature, and our interpretive nature. So nature is real, whether we believe it or not. But so is mystery. Whether you speak of it as transcendence or whatever, there's lots of different ways to talk about it. But I'm not talking about just the realm that we don't know. I'm talking about the entire realm that we don't even know that we don't know. And we will most likely never know. So all three of these, whatever else the word God means, it's got to be at the least a personification of time, nature, and mystery. In fact, any God that's not at least that fails the Anselm test. St. Anselm, a bishop in, I think it was the 11th century, said that if you define God as the greatest being who can possibly be imagined, and that being only exists in your imagination, then a greater being can be imagined, namely one that exists in reality. Thomas Aquinas, one of the Christian church's greatest theologians, said 750 years ago, a mistake about creation will necessarily result in a mistake about God. Now, if that's true, what it means is the more we learn about the nature of the universe, if we're not updating what we mean when we even use the word God, we may have definitions and understandings of God that are so outdated they're no longer life-giving. In fact, they might be deadly. Every characteristic that we attribute to the divine derives from our experience of nature. If we imagine God as beautiful, gracious, loving, awesome, powerful, majestic, or faithful, it is because we have known or experienced beauty, grace, love, awe, power, majesty, or trustworthiness in the world. If we lived on the moon, and that's all we and our ancestors had ever known, all of our concepts and experience of the divine would reflect the barrenness of the lunar landscape. This is obvious when we think about it. We're just not used to thinking about this. Okay, I'm going to use both secular language and I'm going to use religious language, and you're going to see both are legitimate. You can't understand how God or reality created complex life if you don't understand extinctions. You can't understand how reality or God created healthy uh, soil and lakes in the northern part of the world if you don't understand glaciers. You can't understand how reality or God created the periodic table of elements or planets or life or even the atoms of our bodies if you don't understand red giants and supernova explosions. Watch this next photo very carefully. You surely can't understand how God or reality created continents and oceans and mountains if you don't understand plate tectonics. 
Folks, we've only known about this for 200 years, this for about, oh, 160 years, this for maybe 75 years, and this for 55 years. See, we don't believe that the Atlantic Ocean is growing at the same rate our fingernails grow. This is beyond belief. This is knowledge. This is religious knowledge. We've got the satellites to measure exactly how fast the Atlantic Ocean is growing and how fast the Pacific Ocean is shrinking. Evidence is the way God or reality is speaking to us today. Evidence should be considered modern-day scripture. It's our main source of divine guidance today. Scientific evidence, historic evidence, and cross-cultural evidence. And this takes into account also the evidence of our inner experience. Any time, any culture, any tradition, anywhere in the world says God said this or God did that, what follows is always an interpretive personification. We know of no counterexamples in the history of humanity. But it's our inability to read mythic literature that's made us blind and deaf to what God has been revealing to us now for centuries. That's why Thomas Berry called it spiritual autism. God is a mythic or sacred proper name, an I-thou name for reality or nature as it truly is. Again, remember, the word nature didn't exist for the Hebrews either. A meaningful interpretation. God is reality personalized, not a person. In fact, all gods and goddesses are personifications, not persons. And please, no whining. <laughs> because typically, theists start whining in one direction and atheists start whining in the exact opposite direction. Because so many theists start saying, well, wait a second, are you saying my God is only a personification? Well, no, I'm not saying that because what reality is in its essence will always transcend anything we can know, think, or say about it, right? But atheists start whining and say, wait a second, if this is true, then the idea that God doesn't exist just sort of evaporates. Well, that is true. <laughs> but here's the thing. So many of us religious people, when we speak of God, we do so in a fictional way. See, fictional characters exist in two places. Harry Potter is a fictional character. He exists in the literature and in our own subjective experience. I can have an imaginary conversation with Harry Potter. But he doesn't exist in the real world, as we say. So, so many of us religious people speak of God in an unnatural way, in a fictional way. And so as long as we use that kind of language for God, there's probably going to be people like the new atheists who say that God is a delusion. And that God is a delusion. We need to realize that God is inescapably real. And again, don't take my word on it. Google these terms. Google that term. Read this book. I'm standing on solid evidential ground as I talk about this. I think one of the great collective insanities of our time is the theism versus atheism debate. You've got tens of thousands of people that are debating whether God exists or whether God doesn't exist. And both of them have a fictional, unnatural understanding of God in mind. While the one real God, reality personified, we've been out of right relationship to, and we are about to experience the consequences of that that will be of biblical proportion. This is a crazy debate. Evangelicals often speak about an, a, a personal relationship to God. I consider myself an evolutionary evangelical. I'm, a, I'm an evangelical naturalist. I have no supernatural or otherworldly beliefs at all. I don't need it. God's been revealing facts for the last 500 years. But you don't have a personal relationship to God unless you have an honorable relationship to time, an honorable relationship to nature, and an honorable relationship to mystery. Now let me talk about the opposites. A dishonorable relationship to time is if you think it only goes back a few thousand years. When God's been revealing really clearly for hundreds of years, that ain't the case. You have a dishonorable relationship to time if you think the second coming is coming in the next couple decades. So who the hell cares about what the world's going to be like a hundred years from now or a thousand years from now? That's a dishonorable relationship to God, to time. A dishonorable relationship to nature is if you think we can just trash the environment, whatever. You know, I can praise God and trash the environment. Or treat others in an unjust way. Anybody who believes that is out of touch with reality and betraying God. And a dishonorable relationship to mystery is when you think that your tradition has all the answers to everything. We need an honorable relationship to time, nature, and mystery. And when we do, we have a personal relationship to God. 
So again, coming back to these two uh, questions, what's real and what's important, or how things are and which things matter. Religion 1.0 was where we went to for 99% of human history for our authoritative answer for this. Where young people went to was the minds of the elders. It was the collective intelligence of the elders and what had been embodied in the rituals and rites of passage. Religion 2.0 was the authority of Scripture, the sacred texts. And of course, different religious traditions have their different sacred texts, but it's still the authority of the written word. And see, here's the thing. For most of human history, when climate changed and conditions changed, the stories about what's real and what's important would have naturally morphed and shifted until they get written down and declared the unchanging word of God. Then they can't evolve anymore. The only thing that can evolve is our interpretation of the stories. And then religion 3.0 is the authority of evidence, the authority of global collective intelligence, the authority of science, which doesn't mean that we don't continue to value the wisdom of elders and the wisdom of Scripture. We do. I'm not dissing either one of those, but I'm trying to lift up evidence. It's not just secular. It's also religious. It can also help us. In fact, it has to help us now live in right relationship to reality. I think this is, a, this is a core insight in what I'm calling the evidential reformation. Reality is God. Facts are God's native tongue. And if we don't come into right relationship with God, nature, reality soon, we will perish. Now, there is cost to this, especially for us religious people. Secular people won't necessarily feel the suffering here, but we religious people often do. Our youth are abandoning the faith in record numbers. Something like Somewhere between 1,000 and 1,200 young people a day in, in America leave the church and don't come back. Actually, they're not all young people. 1,000, I think it's like 1,200 people leave the church, but the vast majority of them are young people. And when you ask them why, the conflict with science is one of the major reasons. New atheists are mocking religion, and they're doing so by promoting Bible study. I'll say more about that in a couple minutes. The highest rates of teen pregnancy, alcoholism, spouse abuse, and porn addiction are in the most Bible-believing parts in the United States. And evangelicals are being left behind. Evangelicals are in denial of God's factual revolution regarding big history. This just came out a month ago. 77% of evangelicals in the last Gallup, I think it was Gallup poll, said don't believe in a 13.8 billion year universe. Evolution, 76%. And climate, 58% of evangelicals deny the reality of climate change, even though God's been revealing a lot of really important stuff through evidence. So let me, let's sort of shift into talking about climate. I believe that the climate crisis is the single greatest moral issue in human history, and this is not to lessen other moral issues at all. I mean, slavery, the oppression of women, so many other things have been vitally important moral issues. But if we didn't solve slavery at, in, you know, at one time, we could do so the next generation or the next generation. We don't have several generations to solve the climate crisis. So I want to share a, a, uh, a, a TEDx talk, not the whole thing. This is a, an edited version, about seven minutes. This was Con- Connie and I, a year and a half ago, had our climate change come to Jesus moment, where we had our awakening, where it went from back burner to front burner. And it was this talk, and Connie edited this down. And those of you that have seen TED Talks or TEDx Talks, you know that there's not usually music. Ryan Cooper uh, mixed this with some music. So uh, I want to share this because this will um, give you a sense of why Connie and I are so passionate about not just this work that we're doing, but passionate about also supporting the Great March for Climate Action. And I noticed two marchers are here. Could you stand up, please? Yeah. Oh, this is to remind me, actually, to pass out a couple clipboards. About once a season, about four times a year, Connie and I put out an email newsletter. It's usually only four or five paragraphs long at most. But we, all the new stuff that we've added to our main website and other things that we find out about this in this movement. Um, so I'm going to pass a couple of clipboards. You actually don't need to put your name down because I don't enter your name. But about 10% of the people that put their email address down do it illegibly. So if you don't have good handwriting, let your neighbor do it or write it down twice, please, okay? And you, you, you'll never get more than one email a month. In fact, usually it'll be a lot less than that. 
So let's take a look at David Roberts. Climate change is simple. Every, and everything we have built, we have done in this period of relative climate stability. So what we've been doing for the last couple of hundred years is digging up carbon out of the earth and throwing it up into the atmosphere and changing the chemical composition of the atmosphere, like has happened in the past, except for way, 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 way faster. In geological time, the blink of an eye, we are substantially changing the chemical composition of the atmosphere, and all of climate science has been about what's going to happen, what is the earth going to do in response to this. And so we've already seen that the process is underway. We have measured, we have witnessed, observed with our eyes and our thermometers about a 0.8 degree Celsius rise in global average temperature since before the industrial age, since before we started digging all this carbon up. And this may not seem like a lot, less than one degree Celsius, but the thing to know about it is um, these greenhouse gases we throw up stay in the atmosphere for a very long time. There are very long time lags involved here. So this 0.8 degree temperature rise is a response to what we were doing 50 to 100 years ago. And what we see in the first half of this century will be a response to what we've done the last 50 years. And what, and what we see in the latter half of this century will be a response to decisions we make today. So the question is, temperature is rising. How high does it have to rise before we need to worry, before we're in danger, before bad things start happening? Um, the typical answer to this question has been two degrees Celsius. So obviously, what counts as not dangerous versus dangerous is not a hard scientific question. It's a, it's a, a political question. And this was a, a, a political decision to take this 2C number mainly made by European climate negotiators well over 10 years ago. James Hansen is the climate scientist most famously known for raising these warnings, but it's, but it's a growing scientific consensus that two degrees is, is in fact dangerously high. Um, which is bad because we are almost certainly going to blow past two degrees <laughs> Celsius. Um, there's some reason to believe, a recent study said, that even if we stopped our climate emissions tomorrow, we're still going to get uh, more than three degrees this century just from momentum from the previous uh, emissions. But stopping at two degrees now would take a level of global coordination and ambition that is nowhere in evidence. So. A lot of climate scientists don't really want to tell you this because they don't want to depress you, but I'm just a blogger, so I'm happy to depress you. Two degrees Celsius is probably off the table. So then the question becomes, well, what does it look like if temperature goes higher than that? What, what would, say, four degrees uh, Celsius look like? Oddly, there hadn't really been a lot of concerted scientific uh, attention to that question because climate scientists honestly thought we wouldn't do that to ourselves but we are doing it to ourselves. So in 2009, um, several uh, climate change research groups in England drew together a group of scientists, commissioned some papers, and had them really take a hard look for the first time. What would four degrees uh, uh, Celsius look like? There were a lot of papers, a lot of equations, uh, a, a, a lot of talk and complexity. I have helpfully paraphrased it here for you to make it easier to grasp. Um, four degrees Celsius temperature rise would look ugly. Um, <clears throat> among other things, that would be the hottest the Earth has been in 30 million years. Um, sea levels would rise at least three to six feet, and this excludes some really uh, 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 tail end possibilities, but three to six feet at least. And persistent drought would cover about 40% of the currently occupied land on Earth, which would wreak havoc on ag agriculture uh, in East Asia, in Africa, South America, Western US. All this combined would produce hundreds of millions of people who had been driven from their homes, either by their cities being swamped by sea level rise or by hunger or by all the attendant ills that come along with those things. And to boot, probably somewhere around half of the known species on Earth would go extinct. 
The really dangerous possibility is that what are called, uh, the Earth has several of what are called positive feedback systems. So for instance, in Siberia, there's this permanent ice, the permafrost, and it contains a bunch of methane in it. As it melts, it releases that methane. The methane causes more warming, which melts more ice, which releases more methane. It's a self-sustaining process. Or sea ice melts. Ice is white, it reflects energy. When it melts, it becomes dark blue and absorbs more energy, which heats the oceans, which melts more ice, which creates more dark surfaces. You see, there's a number of these systems that are self-perpetuating. And the danger, the great danger of climate change that towers above all these other more specific dangers is that these positive feedback systems will take on a momentum of their own that becomes unstoppable. And human beings will lose any ability to control it at all, even if we stop all our climate emissions on a dime. So this is what I mean by climate change being simple. There are many complicated and fascinating discussions to be had about what to do about it or about what effect our actions might have on the climate and when or which policies are best based on cost-benefit analysis. There's complexity, plenty of complexity for those of you who like complexity. But we now know to a fair degree of certainty that if we keep doing what we're now doing, we will face unthinkable catastrophe. That's the, that's the bumper sticker, that's the take home message. And that, you know, saying, I don't wanna talk about that because I don't know the ins and outs is like saying, I don't wanna raise alarms about Hitler's army being 100 miles out because I don't know the thread count of their uniforms or I don't know the average calorie intake of a German soldier. You don't need to know those things to be scared that the army's on the march and to raise alarms about it. Similarly, if we keep doing what we're now doing, we are screwed. This we know now. To stabilize temperature, and I don't mean stabilize temperature at two degrees or four degrees or six degrees, I mean to ever have a hope of ever again having a stable temperature of any kind, global climate change emissions need to peak, stop growing, peak and start falling rapidly in the next five to 10 years. Um, every year we do not get started on this, we add, according to the International Energy Agency, an extra 500 billion with a B dollars to the price tag of what it's going to cost us to do this eventually. Every year we wait, that's $500 billion down the drain. Now, you and I look around at current politics, particularly US politics, and massive, coordinated, intelligent, ambitious action does not strike us as particularly plausible. In fact, it might strike us as impossible, but that is where we are, stuck between the impossible and the unthinkable. So your job, anyone who hears this, for the rest of your life, your job is to make the impossible possible. The largest and most prestigious science body in the world, the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, just about two months ago came out with a very uncharacteristically prophetic What We Know campaign, where they talked about, based on scientific publish, papers published over this 11-year period, 97% of climate scientists say that climate change is real, humans are the main cause, and we must take immediate action to avoid unthinkable calamity. Now that was only up to 2012. If you look about at this time period here, we're talking about now 99.9%. .9%. And yet, if you do a poll of Americans, 40% of Americans think that the scientific community is divided on this issue. How is that possible? Well, Merchants of Doubt, this book right here, how a, how a handful of climate scientists, uh, or I'm sorry, not climate scientists, how a handful of scientists obscured the truth on issues from tobacco smoke to global warming. 
The same scientists and the same PR companies that confused the issue for 50 years on tobacco are now, for hire, confusing the issue on global warming. I call this the face of evil today. And this book, these two books will ignite a, a righteous fire within you. Moral ground, ethical action for a planet in peril. Where there's like 60 major leaders around the world. I mean, if you want to have your morality ignited in, in a prophetic sense, I highly recommend these two books. I mean, notice, this is just the last 62 years. Notice that the, that the Arctic is warming twice as fast. 1960. 1970, 1980, 1990, 2000, 2012. This is the last 62 years. It's now picking up steam. I consider Bill McKibben a modern-day prophet. He says it's simple math. We can burn less than 565 more gigatons of carbon dioxide and stay below 2 degrees Celsius of warming. Anything more than that risks catastrophe for life on Earth. The only problem? Fossil fuel corporations now have 2,795 uh, gigatons in their reserves, five times the safe amount, and they're planning to burn it all unless we rise up to stop them. And he's a journalist. He's a fabulous writer. Here's another fabulous book. Prophetic. In fact, James Hansen is a modern-day prophet. One of the most respected climate scientists in the entire world, has been for decades, is now repeatedly getting arrested. And when I say repeatedly, I mean repeatedly. Let me look at this. He's got a smile on his face. He knows these guys now. And when you ask him why this level of activism, he himself says why. It's his grandchildren. Storms of my grandchildren, the truth about the coming climate catastrophe and our last chance to save, save humanity. These are some of the best books on climate change in print. Here's a little, short little, like half-minute piece with Amy Goodman on Democracy Now! What do we call civil resistance uh, in the same way that Gandhi did? We're trying to draw attention to the injustice because this, this is really analogous. This, this is a moral issue analogous to that faced by Lincoln with slavery or by Churchill with uh, Nazism because what we have here is a tremendous case of intergenerational injustice because we are causing the problem but our children and grandchildren are going to suffer the consequences and our parents didn't know that they were causing a problem for future generations but we do the science has become very clear and we're going to have to move to a clean energy future and we could do that and there would be many other advantages of doing it why don't we do it because of the special interests and because of the role of money in washington it's one of the reasons why campaign finance reform is so important. Now, this is obviously a question that many of us ponder. Like, what can I do? What can we do? Well, there are so many different things that we can do that we sometimes don't do anything. I'm going to make it really easy. I'm going to suggest that we can all change our light bulbs and drive less and fly less and all that's cool. Stop it. Don't do anything personal. My suggestion, you know, this, is, this is a suggestion, is for the next year or two or three, promote what's calling taxing carbon or a revenue neutral carbon fee and dividend. In fact, James Hansen has been evangelistic. He tells every audience, almost everything he writes, he mentions Citizens Climate Lobby because this is the main organization that is helping to organize volunteers to take action and make a difference so that we put a fair price on carbon pollution. Revenue neutral carbon fee and dividends, or sometimes it's just called carbon tax. I promise you, if you just go to this website, learn about them, join them, just do anything, you'll be able to look a young person in the eyes in another two, three, four, five years when we've done this. Because here's the thing. You want to be able to do this in a way that, 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 that you can look a young person in the eye and say, I helped make that happen. It will be one of the things you'll be most proud of in your entire life. Because once this happens, the entire power of the global market encourages us to do the same thing. In fact, um, uh, do you have a... Okay, uh, there, we've got a sign-up sheet back there. Please, please, please make sure that you see Mark or, or uh, you know, uh, sign up. 
um, because I just can't recommend this too high. This is something that we can all do because here's the thing. We, are, we will do this. The whole world will do this. But whether we do this in two years or whether we wait 10 years to do this, just that difference will make the difference between the suffering of millions of humans and animals over countless generations. It'll be the most important thing you'll do in your life. And you'll know that once it's been done. Because then the entire world, China, India, the United States, the European Union, Brazil, everybody will be mobilized like we were at the beginning of World War II. And this is the organization that's leading that charge. Bob Inglis is one of my heroes. Bob Inglis is a Republican from South Carolina, energyandenterprise.com. And here's a, this is my a fabulous quote. He gets this. He says, I favor a conservative approach that marshals the power of the market and doesn't increase the size of government. This is not about increasing government regulations. Here it is in a nutshell. Put all the costs in all the fuels and eliminate all the subsidies and then watch the free enterprise system solve the energy and climate problem. See, a lot of people don't know we've been subsidizing the fossil fuel industry. This is crazy. And again, citizensclimatelobby.org and also carbontax.org. You can learn more. So if you'd only remember this one thing about my evening program, please write down one of these three or all three of those and, then, and make sure you see Mark afterwards. Here's a, a Christian prophet Nature is party to all our deals and decisions, and she has more votes, a longer memory, and a sterner sense of justice than we do. Wendell Berry. Now, this is some scary stuff. Tom Friedman at the New York Times said, if you only read one book on climate change, make it this one by Paul Gilding. And The Ecotechnic Future, this is my absolute favorite author in the world, John Michael Greer. I, uh, the Ecotechnic Future. Now, I want to come back to these painful questions because, again, this is something that doesn't need to be, but it is currently. Why is it that the most prosperous and Christian nation filled with genuinely good people is betraying the future? Why is traditional religion shrinking in the West and secularism growing so rapidly? I mean, here's the liberal churches, here's the Catholic church, but look here, this is the Southern Baptists. It's not just the liberals. Why are some of the new atheists excitedly promoting Bible study? P.Z. Myers, he's the most widely read science blogger in the world. 50,000 people a day read this guy's science blogs. He's an out atheist. Here's a direct quote. He says, there's no sure way to make an atheist than to get them to actually read the Bible. How can he say that? Well, what they do, what these atheists are doing, Mike Earl, Bible stories your parents never taught you. He's an atheist. And tens of thousands of young people are listening to this, and they're sharing it with others. It's like viral. And the reason is because volume one is the Old Testament, and volume two is the New Testament. And I have never known, I've recommended this to dozens of people, I've never known anybody that could remain a biblical literalist and listen to Bible stories your parents never taught you. It will rock you out of literalism. And these are atheists promoting Bible study. And what they focus on are just our scriptures, just a straightforward reading. For example, a straightforward reading of the Old Testament, the morality of the Old Testament could be summed up as obey the Lord or die. In the New Testament, it's believe in Jesus or fry. And yet our own government, the United States Department of Defense, defines terrorism this way. The calculated use of violence or the threat of violence to inculcate fear, intended to coerce or intimidate others in the pursuit of goals that are generally religious, political, or ideological. Now the good news is that God is not a cosmic terrorist. Believe as I tell you to believe or be tortured forever. That's not the nature of reality. Why are rates of teen pregnancy, alcoholism, domestic violence, and porn addiction highest in the parts of America where the vast majority claim that they're saved from their sin? This is my TEDx talk two years ago focused on evolutionary psychology and brain science. In fact, the last time I was here, I shared a lot on that. And I had several evangelicals come up and tell me what a life-changing experience because they had never known that what God's been revealing through evidence could help them live a more Christ-like life a more, and have healthier relationships. 
And then finally, why have biblical literalists been on the wrong side of history regarding most factual and moral issues over the past 500 years? You can start with slavery. You can start with the, the earth you know, going around Galileo, the condemnation of Galileo. I think all five of these can be answered with one cartoon. Onward, steed in search of truth. Bible tucked under the elbow going the wrong way. It's one of the reasons why I encourage all ministers, priests, and rabbis to subscribe to Science News and get your scientists to help you, know, you interpret what God's revealing evidentially. And a lot of religious people don't like this guy, but I'm telling you, this book is fabulous. Richard Dawkins, The Magic of Reality, How We Know What's Really True. I encourage Bible studies to study that book. Now, a factual view of God, let me wind down here. A factual view of God in Revelation calls forth boldly pro-science prophetic speech. I mean, the United Church of Christ, we've had this, this campaign for now, what, 12 years, I think. And you know what's happened as long as we've had this campaign? We've continued to shrink. I think we need to finish the sentence. God is still speaking, comma, and facts are God's native tongue, exclamation point. I think young people will come back into the churches when we make this kind of a shift. See, the Jesus Seminar and liberal scholarship did the really important work of deconstructing biblical idolatry. But we now need to do the constructive work. What is God saying to us today? So here's where I've been tame up till this moment. I'm going to get started getting a little bold here. I believe that we are in the early stages of what will eventually be called the Great Reckoning. That is where humanity has been out of right relationship to reality, and we're now about to experience the, the natural consequences of that. And it's not because some supernatural being outside the universe is pissed at us and is going to punish us. It's not that. It's because we've been out of right relationship to reality, and now we have to, we have to deal with it. I think it will also be, however, the Great Homecoming. The prodigal species, waking up to our predicament, we squandered our inheritance, we're waking up to our predicament, and hopefully we're coming back home to God, coming back home to reality. Obsolete and impotent notions of God and God's word are killing us, shrinking the church, destroying the world, and condemning our children and grandchildren to hell on earth. Just when religion's moral guidance and righteous reverence for life has been most needed, it's been most absent. Why? Because the church has been blind and deaf to what God has been revealing for centuries, largely because of what I call the triple idolatries, idolatry of the written word, idolatry of the otherworldly, and idolatry of beliefs. Now, I need to make sure that I'm not misunderstood. By idolatry, I am not meaning bowing down to, you know, wooden statues or golden statues. I'm talking about making as our ultimate commitment or primary concern something that doesn't deserve to be or in a way that betrays or defiles the future. Idolatry of the written word is when you think God's best guidance, that is our best map of reality, is frozen in time in the past. Idolatry of the otherworldly is when you think where God resides, where ultimate value, ultimate meaning resides is outside time and nature. And idolatry of beliefs is when you think any one belief system is the only one right way to right relationship to reality. Good people are dangerous, and great people can engage in great evil when their map of reality is outdated or when they privilege ancient mythic texts over current evidential revelation. I mean, I think one of the reasons you've got tens of millions of Americans that their map of reality is two or 3,000 years old and so their understanding of what's important will be skewed. It's not a surprise that America is not leading the world with regards to our response to climate change because 41%, the last poll that I saw, 41% of Americans believe these are the end times anyway, so why bother? There's no sense of commitment and responsibility for future generations if you think that the end of the world's going to happen. So I believe it's legitimate for at least some of us, at least a few of us, to say, here's what God is saying today. And please, I am not channeling an otherworldly entity, and I am definitely not predicting the future. But I am trying to give voice to what the evidence is saying, and I believe God is telling us these things. Facts are my native tongue. Honor evidence as Scripture. Repent of your idolatries or face hell and high water. 
I preached a sermon at a Unitarian church, a large Unitarian church just outside of Denver, and the title of the sermon was God Rebukes the Religious Right, Repent or Face Hell in High Water, right? They gave me a standing ovation, which didn't surprise me at a Unitarian church, right? I preached that same sermon, God Rebukes the Religious Right, Repent or Face Hell in High Water, at a Baptist church in Houston, Texas, and they gave me a standing ovation. That brought me to tears. I was not expecting that. Nature is my secular name. Obey my laws or perish. Abandon apocalyptic thinking. It is an abomination. I mean, this book here, again, John Michael Greer, my favorite author, everything you know about 2012 Nostradamus and the rapture is wrong. Apocalypse not. It's the 3,200-year history of end times thinking and the tragedy, the suffering that has resulted because of people who believed that the end of the world was right around the corner. Secular and religious folk. Purge plutocracy. That is where money rules government. Purge plutocracy and end corporate personhood. Stop polluting the commons. Tax carbon now. And again, here were the same websites that I gave earlier. Cl citizensclimatelobby.org, energyandenterprise.com, and carbontax.org. Now, the good news about climate change, I mean, I could spend an entire evening talking about the good news from this perspective because it's pretty scary. But the good news about climate change, I can sum up in five words. We can see it coming. I'll add another four words. And we can do something. This is the first time in Earth's history that any species could see a potential extinction-level event coming in order, to, in order to do something to avoid the worst possibilities and to prepare for what's already baked into the system. That is really good news. So I want to conclude with the sense that the past is rooting for us, that countless generations of ancestors suffered and struggled, and had they not struggle and suffer, we wouldn't even be alive. So honoring that, honoring their contribution with the awareness that whatever has given life meaning to you and will continue to give life meaning to you, the final meaning of your life is your legacy. So there's the sense of responsibility and being of service. So the past is rooting for us and the future is calling us to greatness because good, bad, great, and evil, these moral terms have always in all cultures been defined by how we impact others and how that ripples out to the future. If I do something nice or kind to you or am I a blessing to the future, I've done a good thing. If I harm others or harm the future, I've done a bad thing. If I sacrifice my own needs in order to be a blessing to others in the future, I've done a heroic thing or a great thing. But if I self-centeredly serve my own needs, screw others to hell with the future, I've done an evil thing. This is not moral rocket science. We don't need 10 commandments to tell us this. We all know this. It's written on our hearts, as they say. And Carl Sagan, I love this. He says, how is it that hardly any major religion has looked at science and concluded this is better than we thought? The universe is much bigger than our prophets said, grander, subtler, more elegant. God must be even greater than we dreamed. A religion old or new that stressed the magnificence of the universe as revealed by modern science might be able to draw forth reserves of reverence and awe hardly tapped by the conventional faiths. Sooner or later, he said, such a religion will emerge. And I believe he was correct in the intuition, but wrong in the detail. It's not a religion. It's not a religion in competition with other religions. A worldwide meta-religious movement has been emerging for decades, largely unnoticed, at the nexus, the intersection of science, inspiration, and sustainability. Beliefs are secondary. What unites us is a pool of common values, priorities, and commitments regarding living in right relationship to reality, whether we use secular or religious names for it, and working together in the service of a just and thriving future for all. And I'm not the only one saying things like this. Paul Hawkins' best-selling, New York Times best-selling book, Blessed Unrest, how the largest social movement in history is restoring grace, justice, and beauty to the world. I actually like the, the subtitle of the hardcover even better. He says, how the largest movement in the world came into being and why no one saw it coming. So the book that I'm now working on has these six chapters. I'm tentatively titling it Religion 3.0, The Evidential Reformation. 
I'm suggesting that these understandings unite tens of millions of us, secular and religious alike. Reality is our God. Or to use secular language, reality is our ultimate com commitment. Or if you're a conservative religious person, whatever we mean by God has got to at least include reality. Maybe more than that. Evidence is our scripture. Again, secular, evidence is, our, or evidence is the main way reality reveals itself. Conservative religious, whatever we mean by divine guidance or divine revelation has got to include evidence. Big history is our creation story. Big history is the epic of evolution. It's the history of everyone and everything. It's our first and only globally produced evidence-based creation story. It's our modern-day genesis. Evolutionary ecology is our theology. Again, and if you're a conservative religious person, all I'm saying is that whatever we mean by theology has at least got to include evolutionary ecology, right relationship to nature. Integrity, that is the practices of living in right relationship to reality, is our salvation. Again, personification, for me, Christ, the risen Christ, is the personification of integrity. And if you think there's any, one, any way to right relationship to reality other than the path of integrity, you are deceived. And a just and healthy future is our mission. There are tens of millions of religious and secular people that basically align with this understanding. That's my claim. And I just put this up. This is free. You could just go to Google. God in Big History. It's a five-part video discussion series designed for church study groups. I welcome feedback. No matter what our attempts to inform, it is our ability to inspire that will turn the tides. Now, I'm almost six foot one. I'm six foot and about a half inch. These guys are tall. The guy on the left is John Mather. He's NASA's senior astrophysicist. He's the 2006 Nobel Prize winner in physics. The guy on the right is Craig Mello. He's the 2006 Nobel Prize winner in medicine and physiology. The reason that they invited me to the Library of Congress is they both had read my book and were doing a program together there called The Origins and Evolution of Life in the Universe. And Craig sent me, Craig sent me an email. He says, Michael, you've got to come to the Library of Congress and get your take, picture taken with us. He said, it'll be great for your book. <laughs> you bet I got there. <laughs> Here's what they said about my book. John Mather said, the universe took 13.7 billion years to produce this amazing book. I hardly recommend it. <laughs> Folks, as an author, it just don't get any better than that. Craig Mello said, the science versus religion debate is over. A must read for all, including scientists. Now, even though this never did get me on Oprah, I thought it would, uh, I did meet with the vice president and executive producer of the Oprah Network just a couple years ago about the possibility of creating a show called Soulful Science. So we'll see. But we did create an 80-second book trailer, and I wanted to share it with you. That's a book trailer, yeah. Uh, actually, we had five Nobel laureates when my book went to print about three years ago. Charles Towns, he now's, he's now 98 years old. He calls me on my cell phone. He, he won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1964 for the invention of the laser. He calls me on my cell phone. He says, I finally got around to reading your book. He said, I love it. So we've got six now. <laughs> So y'all have heard an awful lot from me. I'd love to hear uh, any questions that you have. And also, what, if anything, did you find helpful, interesting, or inspiring? Or what did you find difficult or, or challenging? Is your hand. Yeah, right here. 
Thanks. Thank you, Michael. Uh, if you don't mind, you had a slide about in the middle of your presentation that had a list of um, gods, gods, goddesses, mm -hmm. Poseidon, Helios, Eros, and the last one on the right was Holy Spirit. And you didn't outpicture what the Holy Spirit was personifying as you did the other things. Yeah, I, uh, um, I, I had mentioned that on the earlier slide. The Holy Spirit, to me at least, personifies wind and breath and also the great mystery. Uh, in which everything is held. So for me, I, I, I still like the Hebrew. I experienced the wind as the Holy Spirit. I experienced my breath. In fact, one of the most profound meditations, I trained with Thich Nhat Hanh, the Vietnamese Buddhist peace activist. And so for me, breathing meditation, simply paying attention to my breathing, is communing with the Holy Spirit. But it's also communing with stars because we now know scientifically what God has revealed through science, that when we breathe in, we breathe in atoms that were created inside red giant stars. So everybody, take a deep breath. You breathe in one with 20 zeros, that many atoms, and you breathe out that many atoms. And the atoms that you breathe in were carbon, carbon, uh, uh, car and then you breathe out carbon dioxide, you breathe in oxygen, and you breathe in and out nitrogen. So literally, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen are created inside red giant stars. So every breath is a communion, both for me with the Holy Spirit, but also with stars, ancient stars. Thanks. And then the other question was... Um I just always wanted to ask somebody science, religion oriented. If the universe is expanding, is the earth enlarging? Oh. And if it is, is there a relationship in our, or to our orbit with the sun? Yeah, that, that's a good question. The, the clusters of galaxies are expanding. But for example, the Milky Way and Andromeda galaxy are actually coming closer to each other. Within clusters, they're not expanding because gravitation. But the various clusters of galaxies are all expanding away. So no, the Earth isn't, isn't expanding. It, it's not enlarging that we know of, no. Actually, the moon is actually going further away from us. Test. Um, okay, so my question, it might not be something that you're like qualified to answer, but I'm going to throw it out there anyway. <laughs> okay. Um, and I don't even know the way to describe it, but it's something about uh, the vibrational frequency of the earth has been speeding up. Yeah, I have no knowledge. Okay, yeah. okay, but then the faster vibrations make things happen, allow things to happen faster. Well, there, there is, in fact, yes, the speed at which major transformations happen in Earth's history has been shortening and shortening. So I don't know if that's what you mean, but that's definitely the case, the rapidity of change. Now, whether that continues to happen in a post-peak oil world is another story. I honestly don't know. Was that Steve? Yeah, of course. Thank you very much for the talk. It was great. Um, I have more of a, could be a pessimistic comment or a question yeah, sure. uh, okay. about what we here in this room and outside should be doing. Um, I come from a school of Lewis Mumford, Jacques Ellul, Langdon Winter that yeah. sees that the problems are much larger when it comes to social organization, forms of production, who controls the production for what means. Um, if we look at where the global economy is going right now, those problems are getting worse. They're not getting better. Uh, the third largest user of fossil fuels in the planet is not a state. It's our military. And our military is primarily used for obtaining new resources that fit into this paradigm. You're actually going to have no argument for me whatsoever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mentioned John Michael Greer is my favorite yeah. author. Several of his books deal with the collapse of the American empire, with the, the deindustrial future. So you, you're not going to get any argument from me here. But this is where it will become the argument, I think. Okay. Uh, it's going to be in that perhaps the best use of time, since we did have, you had this discussion of time, we do know that we're all going to be passing away and these problems um, may occur in my lifetime before I pass away, which is a scary thought. Yes. Um, do we spend too much time trying to um, re-educate ourselves with what you're kind of presenting to us today? Because I agree with pretty much everything you've been, been talking about. Are we spending too much time trying to convince other people about that and not taking that time to actually solve the problems themselves? Well, I, uh, if you'll notice that I didn't, I, my encouragement, my sort of suggestion wasn't try to convince your neighbors of this or your mother or your father or whatever, but to basically learn more about taxing carbon and furthering that because that's a systemic shift that isn't going to solve everything by any means, but at least it, it puts the entire power of the global market 
um, to work helping us do the right, just, ecological thing. Because right now, the cheaper, easier, more convenient thing to do is usually the wrong thing to do. We have to redesign the system. And so it's not really, for me at least, it's not about trying to convert others. But I am, I mean, it's obviously, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sharing this as enthusiastically as I can. So clearly there's a part of me that is trying to share in something that can inspire people to have sort of a conversion or a shift. But I'm not suggesting that that's the best use of everybody's time. Yeah. Well, market solutions are absolutely part of the problem. But there, we're also, I, I know of no credible person that suggests that we can in any way, shape, or form co-create a just, healthy, and sustainably life-giving future by keep just ignoring the market or continuing to let it do its destructive thing, what it's doing now. And those authors you cited, I've read them and I value them deeply as well. Other, yeah. I enjoyed your presentation greatly and um, I enjo also enjoyed visiting with you at the uh, at the bridge yesterday, and so, and uh, also salute the climate marchers and think that they're they're making a big impact by yes. helping bring awareness. But I guess one of the things that I would say is that in addition to uh, to doing things like the citizens' climate lobby, we also have a lot of opportunities locally. Absolutely, and we can, we can change the way that that things happen locally. For example, uh, the Omaha Public Power District as a result of people coming together over the last couple of years, has agreed to reduce their carbon emissions by f approximately 50% in the next 10 years. And there's more work to be done, but that's a big step, and we can make changes on the local level. And I guess I would encourage people to, to also engage on those, that yeah. level as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm so grateful that you said that, because I, I, I mean, clearly I was overstating the case by saying don't do anything else but this. I'm not saying that. Get involved. Wherever your joy and the world's needs intersect, follow that. That's your calling. And find local, you know, I mean, by all means, get involved in local things. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, my name's Scott. Um, a fantastic presentation, and I wanted to start with a compliment. Um, I have a modest experience in public speaking, and your um, recitation of the quotes from Barry and Bateson from memory, fantastically impressive. Very well done. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I made a couple of notes, and I guess I wanted to try and ask this correctly. Um, so to be direct and frank, the way that you describe this, and maybe the 500 years-ish that we could say since the scientific revolution, the beginning of science in human history, Right. I guess my question specifically is, and this is very adversarially posed, but I'd like to hear your response. <laughs> Bluntly, does science kill religion? Is this a new type of human um, social evolution, a new type of an ideology that has replaced what we had formerly had? I mean, I think this speaks directly to what you describe as religion 3.0, where we had elders relating oral history, and then we had written history, and now we have evidence. Is this the next thing is, that does this um, subsume the things that religion had previously been for us? Knowledge yeah, no, or let, um, let me, answer let, to the unknown? Yeah. So, yes and no. I don't, I believe that 100 years from now, and even 200 or 500 years from now, there's still going to be, assuming we survive climate change, there's still going to be Christians, there are going to be Muslims, there are going to be Buddhists, there are going to be Jews, there are going to be Hindus. However, they will be deeply ecological and evolutionary. And I believe that within, within the next 50 years, the, the, the majority of religious people around the, let, let me, uh, the, the majority of religi religious people around the world, I believe, will fully embrace an ecological evolutionary worldview. So in that sense, no, I don't think science is replacing at all. But I do believe that science is enriching and deepening and grounding the, the great religious traditions in a global ethic so that our in-group isn't just our religious people, but our in-group is now humanity as a whole or the body of life as a whole. But yes, there will also be people for whom they might be, as I call myself, a religious naturalist or a Christian naturalist, where, where uh, for me, I identify with the Christian tradition, but there will be people who don't identify with necessarily any of the previously existing religious traditions and find their sacred, to use religious language, but their meaningful I-thou relationship to nature through you know, purely an evidential way. So I don't think it's required that people have the other religious traditions, but no, I don't see them going away. 
I just want to. I also want to make sure there's other people. So I guess that second thing is the thing I meant specifically. Um, if if you describe that there might be people who have an I thou relationship, which is purely evidentiary, then um, what does that leave for religion? Why do we need religion? What can religion provide that science alone cannot provide? Well, mainly the whole field of values, inspiration. I mean, the, the, this is why the, this whole field of evolutionary religious studies. There's an amazing book. The only reason we don't carry it is it's still in hardcover, so it's, it's quite expensive. But it's called Big Gods. How religion, basically how we went from tribal folks to where we now cooperate in these big religious traditions. Cooperation has been facilitated. So if you don't understand the evolutionary significance of religion, then it's so easy to just wish religion would go away. And I, I, don't think, I don't think it's likely to do that because it's been playing a role. But that doesn't mean that people who come from a purely evidential perspective can also have a deeply inspiring way, but they have to bring things that aren't necessarily evidential. They have to bring in it values. They have to bring in it, you know, uh, uh, inspiration, joy, comfort, all these things. And there are people that are trying to do this. There's, you know, the book called Religion for Atheists. So there are other ways to do that. Yeah. Hi, I'm Therese, and I'm trying to figure out how prayer fits into all of this. Yeah. And in my mind, I'm, I'm trying to work it out thinking, okay, is the modern version of prayer becoming active with these citizen climate lobbies? Is that a fair statement? Um, I think that is a fair statement, okay. but for me it also goes one other step further in terms of subjective. In fact, Eric and I were talking a little bit about this last night. For me, prayer, when I imagine God as a supernatural being outside a mechanistic universe, prayer was petitioning a divine being outside the universe to miraculously intervene according to however I was praying. But now, have you seen those Russian nesting dolls, like dolls within dolls within dolls? This is one of the fundamental truths that God, reality, has revealed through science. The nested nature of creativity. Subatomic particles within atoms, within molecules, within cells, within organisms, within planets, within galaxies. It was at every nested level, every level can create. Every level can bring something new into existence that didn't exist before. Stars are creative. They create the periodic table of elements. But molecules are creative. Hydrogen, oxygen come together, water is created. So creativity exists at all nested levels. So for me now, in this nested understanding, prayer is like a cell in the body in communion with the very body of which it's a part. For me, it's so much more of an intimate thing. But I have actually a prayerful relationship to this continent. Connie and I personify this continent as Nora. We don't call this continent North America. We call this continent Nora. We've given it a personified name. And we have a more intimate, personal relationship with this continent as a result. We personify our relationship. There's Connie, there's Michael, and then there's Jasmine. And Jasmine is the mythic personification that we've given for us or for we. And sometimes it's really clear what Connie wants to do and it's clear what Michael wants to do. But when one of us asks, what does Jasmine want in this situation, it allows me as a man to not be attached to my position, and I can actually go with something that she might have suggested in the first place, but I don't feel like she's won and I've lost. I feel proud that I'm doing for what's good for Jasmine. Now, why it is that Jasmine usually wants to do what she wanted to do in the first place, I haven't figured that out. But, you know, a happy wife is a happy life, as they say. <laughs> One or two more questions. Yeah. Thank you. Where's population control fit into this? Population control. What I'm going to say is not going to be popular. I do not honestly think we... Well, first of all, population exacerbates virtually every other problem. So it's a humongous problem. I think reality whether you use secular or religious lang language for it, is going to take care of that. I think it's quite likely that 100 years from now, there won't be more than 2 billion people on the planet because of starvation and famine. I don't think we're going to have to worry about population. I think nature's going to take care of that. And I wish that's not the case. My kids and grandkids could be among those. Any other questions? Please, somebody else ask a question. I'm going to leave on. I don't want to finish on that note. <laughs> we'll end with a tough question. Oh, great. Uh, <laughs> what do you think happens to us when we die? Do we oh, continue? I'm so glad you <laughs> asked this. Okay, actually, you know something? I'm going to hold off because I will. I promise I will answer that question. But I'll answer it here in about two minutes. 
okay? Because one of the main programs that kind of, mortality and death, a sacred understanding of mortality and death is a huge central part of my life and, and our lives. So I'll come to that, but give me about two minutes to get there. Tell me a creation story more wondrous than that of a living cell forged from the residue of an exploded star. Tell me a story of transformation more magical than that of a fish hauling out onto land and becoming amphibian, or that of a reptile taking to the air and becoming bird, or that of a mammal slipping back into the sea and becoming whale. Surely, this science-based culture of all cultures can find meaning and cause for celebration in its very own cosmic creation story. Do you know where I found that quote? 17 years ago, it was on the cover of the National Membership Magazine of the Unitarian Universalist Association, and I happened to be staying at a guy's house who was a UU, and he gave me a copy of this, and I was so impressed, I was so blown out of the water with that quote, I decided to track down and marry the author. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a true story. I had never met Connie Barlow before. So I've talked about some scary stuff. Here's how to hold that scary stuff in a way that inspires us to be in action. These are my two great mentors, Thomas Berry and Joanna Macy. This is one of, both of these are in the top 10 books I've ever read in my life. The Great Work, Our Way Into the Future, and Active Hope, How to Face the Mess We're In Without Going Crazy. Fabulous books. And then Tom Atley, my dear friend, Reflections on Evolutionary Activism, Essays, Poems, and Prayers from an Emerging Field of Sacred Social Change. If you're an activist or an aspiring activist, I highly recommend that book. It's well-written, and it's just a gem. If you want to explore this kind of a sacred way of thinking about evolution more deeply, and especially if you want to share this perspective with others very inexpensively, what we most recommend are our DVDs. We say freely burn as many copies of our DVDs as you want. Each of these is three and a half to four hours of our best programs. We have the covers up on the website. So if you have a color printer, you can print off the color covers and make exact replicas for a few bucks. It's a great way to share this perspective with your friends, neighbors, and relatives very inexpensively. And you know, looking around, I'm noticing this isn't a real young audience, so I'm going to say something just in case it's not obvious. This does not mean put them in a fire. <laughs> it means make copies. <laughs> so, and we, have, we now have 11, most of the best material on all these DVDs is included in this thumb drive. 11 hours of videos, and this is really easy to share. A lot of people don't know how to make copies of DVDs. Anybody can loan somebody, you know, a thumb drive and have them drag and drop it onto their computer and then loan it to somebody else. Now, this program here, the first two hours, this is four hours, but the first two hours is a program that I delivered in Colorado Springs, Colorado, to a group of Christians on Tuesday night, and I gave the exact same program to a group of atheists on Wednesday night. And both groups loved the program. I did a survey afterwards. In fact, one of the Christian young women said, I see how this could give me a more intimate, personal relationship to God than ever before. And one of the curmudgeonly atheists the very next night said, finally a God that makes sense and one I can respect. Now, I find this encouraging. The other two hours of this, though, is I did a program with high school girls at a Catholic girls' academy. And I spent two hours, I just let them ask me questions. And they were asking some really conservative questions, virgin birth and all this kind of good stuff. So if you're a conservative Christian or if you have any conservative Christians in your life, I highly recommend this or the thumb drive. Now, the main stuff that I did, actually, those of you that missed my program two years ago, that's it. <laughs> you all recorded it, and we put it on our DVD. So, you know, there you go. Uh, it's called Inspiring Naturalism, Big History, Chaos and Death, and Human Nature. Uh, the program that I did in Colorado, I mean, in, uh, in um, uh, Grand Rapids, because why we struggle and suffer is because we have mismatched instincts and we live in a world of supernormal allurements. I mean, any young man, for example, that thinks that the reason he's struggling occasionally with internet pornography is because his great-great-great-great-great-great-grandmother ate an apple is going to be clueless about how to live in integrity. So this is what this is about. We interviewed my son, who's now 29 years old. He struggled with internet gaming addiction and overcame it. This, and he's also really into evolutionary psychology and brain science. This is something we don't talk about in the church a lot, but evolution and infidelity. Once we lose the shame and blame and understanding what's driving us and why, we can talk about this. 
And then if you're a woman or you have to relate to women, I highly recommend Modern Women with Stone Age Instincts. <laughs> Connie does this program, and it is fabulous. Now, this is mostly Connie. It's got two of my most popular sermons, but three hours and 10 minutes of this is Connie. She does a 45-minute program called Coming Home to North America. It's how we can all become Native Americans in terms of our mindset and our heart set. We can all have an indigenous heart and indigenous ways of being. This is her most popular program of all. We are made of stardust, but this is her great legacy, and this is where I come to the question. Because we now know, Connie does this whole thing. I've, I believe that what she'll be known for 200 years from now is this death material, the gifts of chaos and death in an evolving cosmos. Because we now know, this is what God, reality, has revealed through science, through evidence, that mountains die, oceans die, continents die. Without the death of species, there'd be no complex life beyond pond scum. Without the death of fetal cells in the embryonic stage of development, we'd all be spheres. The reason we have shape is because cells died here, 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 and here. Without the death of plants and animals, there would be no food. I mean, this is obvious when we think about it. We're just not used to thinking about the positive role of death. Without the death of stars, there would be no periodic table of elements, no planets, no life. Without the death of elders, there would be no room for children. Death is essential on a finite planet. So what we've come to know, we don't believe this, we know this, is that death is natural and necessary at every level of reality, and thus death is no less sacred than life. And as I said, this was me four years ago. I went through a very serious bout of cancer, had a tumor the size of my fist in my spleen. And even when, I went through, even when we were looking at the possibility I could die in the next six months, and there was a period of about a month where that was, we thought that was possible, I had what religious people call the peace that passes understanding. And it wasn't because I hold out hope for pearly gates and mansions. I'm a religious naturalist. I'm a Christian naturalist. It seems to me pretty obvious where we go to when we die is the same place we came from before we were born. And whether you speak of that as coming from God and returning to God or coming from mystery and re returning to mystery or coming from nothing and returning to nothing, I think all those are legitimate ways of talking about it. But as I sometimes say, not just humorously, if where I go to when I die isn't the very same place that all other plants and animals and bacteria have gone, I'm going to be pissed. And I'm eternally grateful that whether you call God, reality, the universe, whatever, that I had this experience, because this is my granddaughter at the age of 16 hours, naked on my chest, wrapped up in a baby wrap, one of the highlights of my life. So again, all this death material is on this DVD and also on the thumb drive. And then finally, the major program that I delivered for almost three years was called Beyond Sustainability, an inspiring vision of the next 250 years. And the reason that I picked 250 years is quite simple. If you compress the history of the universe into 100 years, like if you make 14 billion years equals 100 years, at that time scale, every minute is 250 years. So think about it. If we've got 100 years of trends to study, there ought to be a few things we can say about the next minute. And it's actually a pretty hopeful perspective. See, these aren't the major challenges that we might have to deal with. These are the things we're going to have to deal with. And these are the things that we may or may not have to deal with, but by God, if we've got to deal with any of these things, they're going to be huge. This is the scary stuff. I don't leave people here, but I want people to have authentic hope. And we're not going to have authentic hope if we're in denial about what we're definitely going to have to deal with or what we might have to deal with. By the way, this is nuclear, biological, and chemical or genetic nanotechnology, or robotic error or terror. So I don't leave people here, but then I say, okay, what are the long-term and the short-term positive trends that we can bank on? We can trust that these trends are going to continue. In fact, some of these trends have existed longer than humans have ever been around. And then finally, what's the likely good news? I'm not talking about crossing our fingers and toes and praying that Jesus, the cosmic janitor, comes and cleans up the mess we've made. I'm saying what's likely in the next 250 years, given current trends? And again, this is very hopeful. And all of this is on the first two hours of this DVD. The second two hours, I just cover these four points. How this perspective reconciles science and religion. How it transforms our views of chaos how it evokes inspiring, empowering visions of the future, and how it broadens our circles of compassion and care. 
So if you get any of these, please do make copies. But again, most of the content is on the DVD, on the, this. All of the Evolutionize Your Life material is on the thumb drive. Climate and Ecology, some of the new stuff that we've done. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, we have this amazing piece by Neil where he's saying some of the same things Connie and I are saying. New Hampshire Public Television did a documentary that brought me to tears, I was so pleased. And all the Evolutionary Christianity stuff. And then all of Connie's death material. So we're always looking for writing retreats. So if you have a second home or vacation home, and you know, or you go to Australia once a year and you wouldn't mind us house it, please let me know. <laughs> we're always looking for retreat homes. The eyes of the future are looking back at us, and they are praying for us to see beyond our own time. They are kneeling with hands clasped that we might act with restraint, that we might leave room for the life that is destined to come. As I shared on Sunday, the meditation, the guided meditation that I offered on Sunday is what I want to leave you as a, a sort of a homework assignment this week. In addition to, you know, whatever else you do, I invite you to meditate and journal on how is the past rooting for you and how is the path, the future, calling you to greatness? Just journal on that, meditate on that, and see what happens. In fact, I often, I think in both services on Sunday, I invited you to allow some ancestors to give, some ancestor to give you guidance and some being 100 years from now to also speak words of encouragement. I encourage you to revisit that this week. And I'll give Carl Sagan the final word. Science is at least in part informed worship. Thank you. Thanks. And I just, thank you. I just want to say this publicly because, you know, Connie and I, we've spoken to about 2,000 groups, and we've interacted with many, many ministers, and I know you already know that, but you've got one of the very best and one of my closest friends and colleagues in this movement, so thank you, Eric. All the... All the copy, thank you. All the copies of my book are already signed, but I'm also happy to personalize it for you if you want me to. So just bring that up to me, and I'll be here to talk with folks. And Connie's at the book table. So thank you for coming. Mm -hmm. And I also invite you to take a little bit of time. We have coffee, if you're into coffee at 9 o'clock at night, and cookies and water. There is decaf. Um, uh, just to the left there, so we invite you to just take part in a little bit of that, take a little bit of time to chat with people you found interesting tonight and look at the books. Thank you so much for coming tonight, and we sure hope to see you back again for future programs.